Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, coming and uh, inviting me to speak to you and for being here this morning. Um, I've, um, I've found it quite difficult trying to work out what to say to you all. Um, I am not at all convinced I've got something extremely coherent to say because I find it very difficult to be coherent <laughs> on what I want to say. But what I want to say is, um, is, is something I've wanted to say to Christian Climate Action for a long time. In fact, I have a continual <laughs> uh, sort of idea in my head of being invited to speak to Christian Clive Action and what I'd say. And um, so here I am. Uh, and I'm glad you finally invited me. Um, so Yeah, what, what I'm going to talk about is responsibility and what that looks like in relation to um, our responsibility to God. And I'm, I'm going to start off with the situation. So the situation is we're at 1.3 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures and according to a conference this week, we're heading into 1.5 in the next five to seven years. And it means we'll be going over two degrees centigrade in um, the decade before 2040. Two degrees centigrade, according to a recent peer reviewed uh, article, will result in a thousand million people being on the move and that's a euphemism for mass rape, mass slaughter and mass starvation. And once we're over two degrees centigrade, the feedback mechanisms that we all know about will lead to a catastrophic death event for the human race, potentially involving the death of six to seven billion people over the next two or three generations, leaving around a billion people left gathered around the poles, in the words of the director of the Potsdam Institute, who made that prediction two or three years ago, I think. Um, and the Potsdam Institute is arguably the most respectable climate institute in the world or in Europe rather. So I'm, I'm saying that because I passionately believe we have to be continually reminded of the root physical situation and if we don't continually remind ourselves of the reality of coming mass death then we're not even approaching the ability to do something about it. And in a way, I don't know if this is right, but in a way, I suspect that's why there's a tradition in Buddhism that you go and sit with dead corpses to remind you of what death looks like. And only through that visceral interaction with death do you understand what life is and what your responsibilities are. So that's why I'm saying it. Um, so the next thing I want to say is I think we're utterly failing, utterly and catastrophically failing, and we have for 30 years, and there's no sign that we're going to not continue to fail. And if I was a stronger person, I'd get really emotional at this point, but I'm going to bow out and let Larry Kramer speak. Um, hopefully this is going to work. He, um, he made this speech at the pit of desolation around the 
mass death of gay people in the States, 150,000 dead, and no response from the government. And this is the sort of thing I think we need to be saying at the present moment. So hopefully you'll hear this okay. Our, our last speaker is, is Larry Kramer. fucking plague. Plague. 40 million infected people is a fucking plague. And nobody acts as if it is. Nobody in this hospital. Nobody in this city. Nobody in this world. 40 million people is a fucking plague. Every person I talk to in every city, in every agency, gay, straight, AIDS, is as despondent as they can possibly be. Nobody knows what to do next. Nobody knows what to do next. So I, I think it's a uh... A powerful thing to say that no one knows what to do next. No one knows what to do next. We're in 2021, we've had 30 years, and no one knows what to do next, if we're honest. And, you know, I'm very angry at the method, at the Christian church. I'm very angry about the Christian church. And what I want to say is the Christian church is fucking useless. That's what I want to say. I think the Christian church is a total failure. And in saying that, I'm really saying it to myself as well, right? That I've been fucking useless and a total failure. And what I want to say is that at this time when we're facing the unimaginable, our intellect is totally useless. There's 99% of the time the intellect is useful, 1% of the time is totally useless. We're in a time when we're in that 1%. You know, I'm one of the most intellectual people in this country. I wake up thinking, I go to sleep thinking, I've been thinking ever since I was 14. And everything my intellect says is that the intellect is now useless because the intellect in the present moment is basically our ego. It's our desire to maintain control, to bargain with reality. And I think the essence of doing God's will at the present moment is to let go of that intellect and all those rationalizations and all that resentment and denial and confusion. And I think what the Christian church is guilty of and what religious people are guilty of is, is having the air of piety, but not the reality of it. 
and I've seen this all through my life. You know, I was brought up a Christian. My mother was a local Methodist preacher. And, and what we see over and over again are the words, but not the depth. So an example is, is that my best friend at school became a pious Buddhist and he did research on Buddhist ethics and he was, he oozed religiosity and he'd read all the books and he'd written all the papers and he'd studied all the texts and then he went to work in a school and if I remember it rightly, a teacher in the school maneuvered him out of his position and led him to be sacked. And suddenly he was overcome with feelings of extreme hatred towards that person. And he was shocked by the extent of his hatred. And and what he had to learn was that all the bucks were useless because unless you're in a situation of suffering, you'll never find yourself. You'll never find the resilience to deal with the hatred that's within us all. And, and for myself, I've gone through periods of my life where I've over, been overcome with hatred, a, an intensity of hatred that overwhelms me. And that's been a great teacher because that gives me the resilience to know myself. But that's only through living a life of material struggle, as you might say. So this is extremely difficult and I have a sense that what God is does is plays a game with us, but we have to, in giving ourselves to God, we have to consider that we're following the devil rather than God. And we have to take that risk that we may be doing the worst thing by doing the best thing because we'll never quite know. Because if you follow the path of God, then you'll be attacked as really following the devil by society. So you'll never really be able to work it out. And the most difficult thing is to, is to accept you'll never know and hand it over to God. So I want to say something about Martin Luther King in the letter to the Birmingham, in the letter from a Birmingham jail, he wrote that white liberals are a bigger block to black liberation than the Ku Klux Klan. And what I want to suggest is the climate movement in its present state is a far greater block to sorting out the climate crisis than the deniers and the extreme right. And the reason for that is because the white liberals, of course, have all the words and the books and the right arguments and the sophistication, but they're missing the only thing that counts which is the willingness to enter into material resistance against radical evil. And in so much as they occupy a place of dominance within the movement, then they prevent that radicalization that Martin Luther King saw as essential in order for people to enter into civil resistance. And an essential and terrifying element of that blockage is the insistence on academic uh, and intellectual sophistication. In other words, the sophistication is what creates the block. Radical political change is produced by entering into dogma. 
for all my life I've been against dogma for all the reasons we know. But the only thing I see now that will save us is entering into a dogma that is rooted in knowing what God means. A dogma means that something's totally unacceptable. And any civilized society has to have dogmas in order to not slip into total relativism. And we have a dogmas in our society. One dogma is that child abuse is totally unacceptable. We have another dogma that rape is totally unacceptable. And we're going to get nowhere unless we understand that putting carbon into the atmosphere is totally unacceptable. And that's like an act of non-negotiation. So, the test for me uh, following God at a time of radical evil and the test throughout history has not been the words and the sophistication and the Sunday morning discussions. The, the essence of following God and being in the light of God at a time of radical evil is whether or not you are in a situation of material resistance against the regime. And in this respect, the originator of civil disobedience, uh, Thoreau, in the 19th century, really is the foundation stone of what I'm trying to say here. And in his book on civil disobedience, he makes it clear the fundamental proposition that at a time that one's government is engaged in injustice and uh, evil, then the position of um, any just person is to be in prison. That's what he was saying. So for me, like, there is only, there's something very concrete here about what I'm saying, just as there's something very concrete about putting CO2 into the atmosphere. What I'm trying to say in this talk isn't at all abstract. What, what I'm saying is the only position place for a Christian at the present moment is in prison. Not because you desire to go to prison, but because prison is a bright byproduct of resistance. If you go out and disrupt the government that is facilitating radical evil, then the result of that will be you go to prison. You'll go and paint walls, you'll go and glue yourself, you'll go and sit in roads and you'll keep doing it because being in resistance is not symbolic activity, it's a continuous act of resistance. And it's that continuousness that leads to people going to prison because the state has no other option but to get you physically out of the way. It's a physical process, in other words. And what that means is something concrete, just as it means in the past. And this is skated over, over and over again when people talk in abstract ways about resistance. When you enter into resistance, you will lose your material security. You will very likely lose your relationship. You will lose your job, your status, your friends. And that's really what it means. When I went to King's College and caused £7,000 worth of damage on their walls and went on hunger strike for two weeks, the main sacrifice was not those two things. 
The main sacrifice was losing my accommodation and having no money to continue my course. So for the next three years, I slept in my car underneath my desk in my PhD room. But this is not caused me any bitterness because I already knew that that was what was required. So I was ready for it. And this is the work we all have to do. We need to be ready for that level of sacrifice and accept it willingly because that's what it means. That's what it always meant. And that's what it always will mean to live in the path of God at a time of radical evil. <clears throat> so having said all that, as you know, I'm a strategist, which is one of the paradoxes of my personality, because I'm drawn to say what I've just said. And at the same time, I spend most of my waking hours working out how to be effective. Well, what I'm trying to say in summary is the only way you'll be effective is by first doing that work that I've just spent 20 minutes talking about. And when you've done that work, then you can assess the tactical priorities. I haven't got time to go into that in detail, but I'm happy to talk to people on another occasion. But the summary of the strategy, in my scholarly opinion, is that the first point of confrontation is with the church itself. In other words, what Christian climate action should do is go and paint the churches to the extent that the churches get into a rage. In other words, you bring the implicit violence of the church's complicity in evil out into the explicit violence of ostrification, which will happen. And once that has happened, then you'll recruit the 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 people who are prepared to enter into classical resistance. And at that point, you pivot to the state, the actual government itself, to the extent of being put in permanently into prison. And even when <clears throat> your project gets to 500 people in prison, then you'll see some material progress. That's the project. There's nothing abstract here. There's not really much room for debate. What I've just said to you has been done many times before in history. So I'm going to finish my self-admittedly inadequate talk <laughs> with two quotes. Um, so if I was doing a, a pleasant middle-class Christian presentation, I'd finish with Albert Einstein. And the quote I'd use is the following, which is, those that have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So that's a polite way, a repressed way, an intellectual way of saying what Larry Kramer said. Larry Kramer, in my view, is the most successful political change figure of the late 20th century. And the reason for that is because he, he oozed emotional rage. And really that's what I'm calling for you to manifest difficult and excruciatingly um, difficult as it is. So here's the translation, and this is my final comment. Larry translates it as, fo as follows. Get out into the streets, otherwise you're gonna fucking die. Thank you. <laughs>